Good afternoon, everybody. If we could take a seat and bring our conversations to a close. Our next presentation is going to be by Randy Milby, CEO of Theramune. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you. Thanks for joining today. So I just want to read the mission statement. You can see it under our name, Unlocking Immunology for a Better Tomorrow that Improves the Patient's Quality of Life. So today what I'm going to do is talk about our lead, pro, lead product, which is for extreme itch or chronic pruritus in patients with an autoimmune liver disease called PBC or primary biliary cholangitis. There's a couple of things that I'd like to answer for you today. First of all, I want to answer the question, what is it? Why is it unique? What's the problem we're solving? How does it work? Are you sure it works? And then can you do it? Those are the questions that I hope I've answered to you by the completion of this presentation. I will be making some forward-looking statements. You can find everything about us. We're on, on our website, the SEC filings at www.theramune.com. So TH-104 is our lead. We say it's a de-risk clinical program because the active ingredient has already been approved by the FDA. But we have a novel drug delivery system, and that's what makes it unique. And we have intellectual property around that. We've recently completed the phase one study. We'll put the final top line data out this quarter, and we anticipate starting the phase two in the second half of this year. We raised $11 million with Think Equity in November of last year, and that takes us into the first quarter of 2025. We'll talk about PBC, but there's also, you'll find out during this presentation, there's plenty of market opportunity in other diseases that have pruritus as a bad actor. I'll talk just briefly about our extended pipeline in the ADC and the oncology area, and we have intellectual property around this buckled delivery system and around the active ingredient itself. So what is it? It's an almathene in a transmucosal film. It's pictured like a Listerine strip, only this attaches to the inside of your cheek. The indication here is for moderate to severe chronic pruritus in PVC patients, primary biliary cholangitis. I'll talk a little bit about the mechanism here. As you can see on the left, it says more and core. That stands for mu opioid receptor and the kappa opioid receptor. I'll talk about why that is important in itch in a few minutes. But I think the key thing for you is to look over on the right-hand side. And that is this quarter, phase one top-line data. Third quarter, start the phase two study. Early 2025, phase two top-line readout. And then potential registration trial initiation in 2025. As I mentioned, we do have some immuno-oncology products, which is an early stage you can see down below. The HER2 and HER3 for you, those are not pronouns. For those of you that know the cancer area, it stands for human epidermal growth, growth receptor factor. And it's both the HER2 is known for increasing the metastatic cancer and breast cancer. We also have some platform technology that's in the PD1 or HER2, HER3 area. But I'm focused today and our money is focused on advancing TH-104 and chronic pruritus. There are over 4 million patients in the United States with liver disease. 1.7 million of those patients suffer from pruritus. As you can see on the right, pruritus is a bad actor in a number of liver diseases. Let me just go through some of those acronyms there. PBC, primary biliary cholangitis. NAFLD is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. PSC, primary sclerosing uh, cholangitis. So you can see that uh, even though pruritus is a bad actor in a number of liver diseases, we're focused on one, we're focused on PBC. Why is that? Because of the higher concentration of moderate to severe pruritus in that patient population. I always tell the team we have to get one through the keyhole first. So let's focus on PBC where there is a high concentration of moderate to severe pruritus. 
Now we know nalmethine, it's already been approved. As I said, it's already on the market. It's approved as the IV form and an intranasal form for acute use opioid overdose. On the right-hand side, this is some work that was done with an oral tablet. Now there's no oral tablet approved in the United States. The oral tablets approved in Europe for alcohol use disorder. So what they did was they looked at this nalmethine, does it work in paritis or PBC patients? And you can see it does, but a high, very high concentration. The oral dose ranged from 40 to 240 migs twice a day for 12 weeks. Now you already know that these patients have liver disease. When you take an oral drug, the first pass effect, it goes through the liver. And as you can see on the left-hand side here, this was ex explained, the efficacy was established, but it was very dangerous for these patients because it goes through the liver metabolism. So what we've done is taken that drug and put it in a pri proprietary biodegradable transmucosal buccal film. As I mentioned, it's like a Listerine strip. The intellectual property is, as you can see in the picture on the left, you attach it to the inside of the cheek, the size of a dime. Our intellectual property has to do with the way you've micronized the nalmethine itself because you just don't put it on a, a buckle strip. It had to be micronized. And the intellectual property goes around the way that the design of that buckle strip so that it actually adheres inside the cheek. What this does is on the right-hand side, it's once daily dosing. It has a very rapid onset and very high absorption. The reason this is important is you bypass the liver. As I mentioned in the previous slide, these patients already have liver disease. So by giving this as a buccal administration, you're bypassing the liver, and therefore you get a higher absorption, and it's designed to treat these liver conditions. So a little more about PBC, as I talked about is moderate to severe chronic pruritus. This is an extreme itch. This is not the itch that your grandmother used to say, oh, my nose itches, company is coming. This is an excruciating itch. And you can see that as patients describe in the upper left, they, de they describe it as the worst, most unimaginable itch, like bugs crawling underneath their skin. Unfortunately for these patients with this liver disease, the itch is actually worse at night. As you can see at the lower left-hand corner, 65% of these patients have their worst itch, so they call it nocturnal pruritus. PBC is an orphan disease in the United States, less than 200,000 patients, the same number of patients actually in Europe as well. It tends to affect women more than men, but what you can see that what PBC is, it's an autoimmune disease as I described earlier. It's an inflammation of the bile ducts, and that inflammation of the bile ducts, therefore the bile is excreted into the bloodstream. And that causes, this not only causes additional liver damage, but it screws up the internal opioids receptors. And that's what this side shows. On the, left, on the right hand side, CLD says chronic liver disease. What you can see is that the liver says, hey, we've got a problem here. So the liver starts generating more opioids. So it's overexpressed. These endogenous opioids are overexpressed. The cartoon on the left-hand side, you can see in a parotid skin, you can see there's an imbalance between that mu opioid receptor and the kappa opioid receptor. What nalmethine does, it brings that back into balance, that kappa opioid and the mu opioid. And we know that this works because we've looked at this outside of the United States. This was a study, it wasn't placebo controlled, single dose, single center, open label, but what we're looking at here was chronic liver disease, patients that had a liver disease, and you could see that the, the uh, called the cohort A was this child mu A and cohort B um, was child, that's just mild, mild liver disease versus more moderate liver disease. But we're using the scale, as you can see, the third bullet down on the left-hand side, that's the same scale that the United States would use for measuring pruritus. And what you can see at the very bottom of these 12 patients, they had a mean decline of 33% of their total itch score. That's with a single dose at 24 hours. So we knew it worked. But then we also looked at another phase one study. How does this compare with that oral, uh, oral nalmethine that's available in Europe only? And on the left-hand side, you can see that actually the buckle delivery, you got a higher concentration 
in the body than you did on the oral, which makes sense because if you give it orally, it gets metabolized by the liver. It's a little hard to read on the right-hand side, but we looked at the side effects. How do the side effects compare with this buccal delivery? The third one down is somnolence. So there is an over, there's more somnolence. Somnolence is sleepiness. So there's more somnolence in the patients that have this buccal administration, which is perfect. Because as I mentioned in the previous slide, 65% of the patients have nocturnal pruritus. The itching is actually worse at night. They wake up bloody from scratching themselves because it's an automatic behavior. So I mentioned an earlier slide, the rapid absorption. This gets in the body. It's absorbed within five minutes. It reaches its peak within 30 minutes. So the way it will play out for these patients, 30 minutes before bedtime, they attach this inside their cheek. It reaches their peak blood levels 30 minutes within 30 minutes, and they can hopefully improve their quality of life by having a good restful sleep. As I mentioned in the first slide, we've completed the phase one study. It was a relatively simple study. Why was it so simple? Because the FDA has already approved nalmaphene for other indications. They have plenty of safety data. So what they asked us to do was look at a simple study. It's a simple bridging study. It's a crossover study. What we did was with 16 patients, we took one group, one dose, single dose, put the buccal film in, and then the second group was an IV nalmaphene. And then we measured the bioavailability. We did a washout. They came back seven to 11 days later. And then the group that had the IV then had the buccal, and the group that had the buccal then had the IV. Now, we released preliminary data on this that showed well tolerability, nothing unusual from a tolerability point of view. And then, as mentioned, we'll do the top line or the full top line readout this quarter. And there we'll release the absolute bioavailability data. This is what the FDA asked because they already know this drug. So PBC, paritis on the left, the current forecast is expected to reach between 350 to 500 million in the United States for paritis and PBC. On the right-hand side, we're focused on liver disease, PBC in particular. As I said, that gets one through the keyhole first, but there's other causes of paritis, and they include not only the liver disease, as I shared with you, the number of liver diseases, but also paritis is a bad actor in chronic kidney disease. 24% of those patients have moderate to severe paritis and an atopic dermatitis or ecosema. Now that's a derm application. That's not something we would do on our own, but definitely after we have our phase two data, this would be something we would go out and be interested in partnering. On the PBC side, what the PBC market is, CMMA was recently acquired by Gilead, and they and GenFit, both CMMA and GenFit, their PDUFA dates are the second half of this year for PBC. Intercept has already been launched, but what the, the interesting point about these, they're treating PBC. I want to reiterate, we're treating paritis. That's a result of PBC. Unfortunately for these patients, if they're even treated for PBC, it doesn't alleviate or negate the paritis that they suffer from. Other companies that are in paritis, as you can see on the right-hand side, Cara Therapeutics, which is in chronic kidney disease, would be the closest competitor as far as, but here again, that's an IV administration. So what we're talking about is once a day, a buckle delivery inside the cheek, 30 minutes before bedtime, entering phase three in 2025. We're focused on this PBC paritis as I showed you in a couple of other slides, we have expansion opportunities in other liver diseases and other diseases in general. So here's what you hold me accountable for as far as the execution of the milestones. As I mentioned to you, we'll do the readout for the phase one study, that bridging study in the second quarter. We'll initiate the phase two trial uh, for TH104 and PVC patients in the third quarter, get top line readouts the first part of 2025 and potential registration in the second half of 2025. As far as the cap table goes, um, 11.7 million shares outstanding. Uh, at the 10K, we had $10.9 million in the bank. The, the stock price today was closed at 37.5 cents with a market cap of 4.4 million. Our burn rate is the phase one study, if you wanted to run the math, the phase one study cost about a million dollars. 
the phase two study will cost about between four to six million dollars. And as I said at the very beginning, that takes us into the first quarter of 2025. So going back to my timeline, you can see that we're going to have the top line readout in the first part of 2025, which is a major inflection point for us. As far as insider ownership, um, insiders own 2% of the company at, at present. Who's going to make it? Who can, can we do it? The question I ask, can we do it? A little bit about my background. I'm a pharmacist by training. I was an ROTC scholarship uh, winner, so they, the Army paid my way through school. So I finished, uh, I served four years in the military as a hospital pharmacist. Once I finished my military obligation, I went back for an MBA at Washington University in St. Louis and started my business career at Bristol Myers Squibb in a management development program. I had a lot of very cool jobs at DuPont Merck, both in licensing, business development, global marketing, um, pretty much the whole gamut of sales. And prior to this, I was the CEO of another publicly traded company called Cormedics. While we were there, we took the company from a 3 million market cap to 350 million. In 2017, I started this company when my brother was diagnosed with multiple myeloma. And Shreesh Apajoshala is my chief operating officer. He and I are the only two full-time employees. Shreesh is a background. He's a PharmD by training. He's done a lot of work in clinical development and in licensing. And he's done from startups to big companies, as you can see as well. Other executive team members are Tom Hess, my CFO, and then Nir Barak as the chief medical officer. I have a very good board of directors. One of them, Kelly Anderson, sitting here, second row back. Um, what I like to use the board for is the board helps me see around corners. The board asks tough questions, both on strategy and on execution. And sometimes it can get, they're tough, but we always treat people with respect and they bring out the best and they're thinking about what's best for the shareholders. Two of my most notable board members, Leonard Mazur, obviously the CEO of Sidious, had a number of successful startups and exits. Kelly Anderson, who's here, she's had a number of successful startups and exits as well. And she sits as the chairperson of my audit committee. So a recap, why us, why now? It's a de-risk asset. The drug has already been approved. We're taking it, we micronized it. We have intellectual property around the way we've micronized it, the way we put it on this novel delivery system, this buckled delivery system. We're gonna have a, our phase one readout this quarter. We'll start the phase two study. We'll put out press releases when we start the, the study, when we get feedback from the FDA on the design of the phase two study. We're funded through into that first quarter of 2025. And as I shared with you, we should have the readout for the phase two study by then. It's, we're focused on PBC, get one through the keyhole first, huge unmet need. There's no drug on the market for PBC paritis, but there's expansion opportunities here. And once we have that phase two data in PBC patients, we feel that we can go to Europe and talk to companies that are in Europe that treating PBC, as well as expand into these other liver diseases. I haven't talked much about our pipeline of the platform technologies, that's bispecific, the ADCs, as you know, antibody drug conjugates. Um, we're doing bispecifics on the HER2, HER3, as I mentioned. But this is further back. The resources and the time and effort are being spent right now on advancing TH104. Intellectual property, as I've talked about, has been around the buccal film itself. How do you get this buccal film to attach to inside of a wet environment? And the micronization of the nalmathine so that you can get the exact concentration you need on that buccal film. That's it for the prepared presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. Yes. The question is how is it packaged? Yeah, it's packaged on a little strip. So that's actually the nice thing about the manufacturing of this, it runs through strips strips that run through and you put just the exact amount of this micronization on it and then you evaporate off the, the uh, alcohol with it. We haven't put the final delivery packet, but it'll be something like that so that you can easy to, easy to carry and easy to apply, obviously. 
Yes. Could you talk a little bit more about uh, the potential economic of monetizing that intellectual property of the bank because of delivery technology? Presumably, you can license that out to a lot of other folks. That, you know, you, you have the, the uh, drug on one hand, but then you have this delivery technology on the other hand. What about monetizing that to the next level? So the question has to do with the monetization of the buckle film itself, not only in using it in other applications, because as we've, we've licensed it exclusively with enamel for this, we do have the opportunity. We acquired this, we licensed it in, we have the opportunity to acquire it for other actives as well. But as I said, I like to keep the team focused. We have the option to go back for other drugs. And one of the things about this that makes the intellectual property a little different though, he had to, we had to tweak the actual comp the composition of the buckle film for the active. But that's one of the things from a long-term point of view is taking that technology and using that delivery technology with other actives. Yes. Would it be possible to do a vaccine study with, in, the, in the phase two? Basically? So the question is uh, possible to do a basket study in the phase two study because what she's highlighting here is that there's liver diseases. Paritis is a bad actor in a number of liver diseases. We've, we're talking with, um, uh, we've put out a press release of two of our scientific advisory board members. We're having that discussion with them too, uh, now. Um, Alan Bonder of uh, Harvard and Andreas Kramer of Zurich. So they're very experienced in this space, but right now we're focused just on PBC. One thing as we get more of that data though, we'd like to expand it rapidly into some of those other diseases. Particularly, yeah, her comment is that oncology, this is very common. And particularly in this case, as I mentioned, paritis is nothing to treat paritis in PBC patients. And paritis is a bad actor in a number of liver diseases, as well as the chronic kidney disease and atopic dermatitis. Yes. So the question has to do with, you know, the MASH with Madrigal getting that approved and um, just liver in general. And here again, it circles back to the paritis across any of these diseases. So MASH, as you know, um, a lot of those, the treatment of those does not alleviate. I've looked at some of the data and it doesn't alleviate all the itch in these patients. So a liver disease in itself is the bad actor. So whether it's MASH or whether it's PSC or PBC, whatever, this will go have applicability. In my dream world, it would be, it'd be used in addition to all these other therapies because they're not alleviating the itch. They're not alleviating the paritis. And that's why you go back to our mission statement, improve the quality of life of these patients. So regardless of what drug they're on. Any other questions? Timing is impeccable, so I just got the one minute left. So thank you very much.